of God, giving praise and worship to the living God, who through the sacrifice of the cross, we have forgiveness of sin. such as us. 
God. We're going to pray tonight, believing God for uh, uh, many, many things. And so we want to pray always for our leadership churches, Prescott Congregation, Pastor Greg, his wife, um, and also Pastor Lobato and Bullhead City Congregation, his wife as well. We want to pray for our baby works uh, all across the nation and across the world. 
to believe God for them as they're, uh, some of them are in service right now. And uh, so believe God for them. Uh, and we also want to pray for many people for salvation. We're praying for uh, Danian, uh, or Danian, Dominic, David, Addy, Andre, Mary, and Isaac for salvation. Maybe, some, maybe you know somebody, you want to pray for them for salvation. Lift their name tonight. We also are praying for healing for several people, for Judy, praying for her father as well, praying for Reuben, uh, Colleen, Isaac, and Ruby Barnes for healing tonight. So let's lift our voices tonight, believe God, and we're going to uh, ask if uh, Danny Santiago would open us up in prayer tonight. Let's pray, church. Father, we come by the blood of Jesus, and we give you praise and glory, Lord God. We magnify your name. God, we thank you for your kindness and grace, Lord Jesus. We give you great praise and honor, Lord God. We magnify you, Lord. We're asking that you have right of way in this place tonight, God. Speak to every heart, anybody that's unsaved, that you rescue them, Lord God, by your spirit. Hallelujah, Lord God. We thank you this night, God, for your grace and your faithfulness. God, once more, we invite you to meet with us. Help us, Lord God. God, that we come believing in you, Lord God, with our list of needs, Lord God, of family members, uh, God, friends, co-workers that are insane, that you would move, Lord, draw them to you as a place of need, repentance, and decision, Lord God. Father, we lift up, Lord God, our missionaries, our pioneers in this time, Lord God, those holding services, that you would visit them as well, Lord God, and we thank you for your grace and all that you to do this night, God. We ask for your grace anointing upon your word, Lord God, speak to every need, every issue, Lord God, draw us to an altar this night, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Turn and greet somebody. Welcome out to service this evening. Christian Fellowship Church. Glad you decided to join us today. If it's your first time visiting, welcome. If it's your one millionth time visiting, welcome as well. Before we get into the preaching of the word, we have a few announcements we'd like to share with you. But before we get into the announcements, let me show you where you can find all this information. We have our church app here. Just click on it, tap on the weekly calendar, and here you can see a schedule of all our events. So continue to scroll down. Everything is listed right there for you. And for those that prefer a paper calendar, you can pick one up at the front door. And we have all of our list of events, as well as the events coming up in the months to follow. On Sundays, we have Sunday school starting at 9.30 in the morning for ages three and up. On Sunday morning at 10.30, we have our morning service. We also have our service at 6.30 p.m., which is also a different message than the morning service. We also have children's church for children ages three all the way up to the sixth grade at 6.30 p.m. Every single day of the week, we have morning prayer starting at 5 a.m. all the way till 10 a.m. So join us for that before you get your day started so you can lay a hold of God. On Tuesday at 7 p.m. here at the church, we have our Difference 180 class. That class is centered around folks that are trying to overcome addiction, depression, or various other things. Come join us for that. On Wednesday night, we have our midweek service at 7 p.m. The building's open at 6 p.m. for prayer, so come pray before service. On Thursday, se habla español, tenemos estudio bíblico a las 7 aquí en la iglesia. Friday, we have Mommy and Me for the moms and children for ages 5 and under. Come out at 10.30 and be a part of that. Saturday, we have our local outreach here at the church at 3 p.m. with various out-of-town outreaches for some of our neighboring churches. You can check the calendar to find out when the next outreach is taking place and where it's going and sign up on our app, of course. 
Saturday night at 7.30 p.m. Come join us for our City Light Cafe, where we have live bands and drama skits every single week. Check out our church app to follow along in the Bible reading plan. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we got a couple other things. Um, right after service, gentlemen, if we could get some men to help us out to set up some tables. Miss Lynn is needing seven tables for the baby shower that's tomorrow night. Amen. Gonna we're going to have a, a baby shower for uh, Gloria and uh, so their little precious little baby. So that can be tomorrow night at 7 p.m., ladies, if you can be there for that. And then uh, on the 20th, I uh, want to uh, put out there, uh, we've got a working party that's on Saturday for uh, Austin Wor Pastor Austin Worm over there in Garner. So if you have construction abilities, please help us out with that. Uh, you know, tomorrow morning, first thing in the morning, the church is, is open, as I know you saw in the, in the video there. Um, but I just want to really encourage you, you know, uh, Pastor was talking to me this, uh, just before service. He's like, you know, the prayer room is, is bilingual. Amen. Now, think about it. It's actually more than that. It's multilingual, right? Because you could pray in English. You could pray in tongues. You could pray in Spanish. You could pray whatever other language you might know. Uh, but the, the important thing is, you know what? We really, we need to lay hold of God. And, and uh, you know, pa I so appreciate what Pastor was preaching this morning. And just talking about, you know, guarding those first minutes, those first moments of each day, that is absolutely foundational to a long-term relationship with God. It really, truly is. And one of the things that, you know, just speaking personally over the last 22 years, one of the, one of the things that has been absolutely uh, a, a reference point that has saved me over and over again, not like in the sense of Jesus saving me my soul, but saved my relationship with God and helped me to stay on track is prayer before uh, in the first thing in the morning and then also before service. You know, um, we all don't don't just don't ever you should never come to service just thinking, hey, uh, all those that are in ministry, they're the ones that that uh, they put on service. No, uh -uh, that's completely wrong mindset. Every person here, you are part of the service tonight. Your, your presence, your, your spirit, and your relationship with God plays into everything that God does during the service. And so prayer before service is absolutely essential because we're dealing with issues in our hearts, perhaps, uh, dealing with you know, whatever things we've been going through in the day. Uh, we're laying hold of God. We're praying for other people. We're praying for God to have liberty in the service. And you might not be in a ministry. Maybe you can't. Maybe you're like me. You couldn't sing to save your life. Amen. That's fine. But you can pray. Every last one of it, it requires no talent, requires no ability. All you need to do is just be able to talk to Jesus. And anybody can do that. And so I uh, really want to encourage you. You know what? We need to lay hold of God. Amen. And so uh, come in the morning. Uh, don't, don't start your day without Jesus. Amen. And, and don't start service without Jesus either. Amen. A um, couple other things we got. Coming up this week, we've got an impact team heading to New Bern, and that's going to be leaving at 9 a.m. on Saturday. So uh, if, if you haven't signed up for that, if you want to go to that, please help our, our brother out over there, uh, Christian Everest. He needs, uh, uh, needs some help with the uh, impact team. And so you can sign up for that on Friday. Man, Pastor, uh, put it up there, guys. There you go. Peaches. Pastor John? Don, Don. Pastor Don. There we go. Pastor Don. Uh, he's Pastor Sispansky's cousin, as you can see. So <laughs> we just don't know how to pronounce that one yet. We've, we've known Pastor for long enough. We got it down. But uh, that one, we're going to have to ask him how do you pronounce that. Amen. <laughs> but uh, wonderful opportunity, uh, long-term minister of the gospel, long-term pastor. And so he's got something in part, men. Let's not miss it. Let's be here Friday, 7 p.m. prayer, 8 p.m. Men's discipleship is going to kick off. And then looking a little bit further down the calendar, uh, 27th, we're uh, going to have a special city light. So it's going to be a karaoke, karaoke potluck. Chauncey Ray is going to have a sign-up sheet if he doesn't already. Is it already out there? It's already out there. So sign up for that, and uh, uh, we'll see who can uh, bring the best dish and sing the best. Amen. And then the 29th, got the baby shower for Asia and baby DeAndre. I hope that's right. Um, uh, and so that's going to be 7 p.m. Uh, right here. 
See Lynn for the big gift on all the baby showers and everything. She has all the details, all the plans, everything you could possibly want to know about a baby shower. Lynn's got that under control. Don't forget right after service to help her out with that, uh, with those tables, gentlemen. That's all we got for uh, announcements. Let's give God praise. The ushers come. We're going to give an offering tonight. Father, we thank you, Jesus. Lord God, we bless your matchless name. We exalt you and worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Just want to encourage you to be faithful. Let's uh, be faithful with your tithe, your offerings, pledges. And uh, just want to ask if uh, Brother Antonio, would you bless the offering tonight? into the house of the Lord. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer unto him the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer unto him the sacrifices we bring. of joy. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, and we offer unto Him sacrifices of thanksgiving, and we offer unto Him the sacrifices of joy. Amen. God bless you tonight, and we hope you have that joy. Amen. I read that in my Bible reading the other day, just the scripture. It says, "Bring that sacrifice of praise." And I always pause. I mean, I've probably read it a thousand times in, in almost 50 years of being saved. But every time I read it, it makes me pause and think on that. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that claim to know God that do not carry the joy of the Lord anywhere. You'd have to ask them. You know, they're like the little girl who, who uh, saw them walking through the pasture along the pasture fence with her grandpa one day, and there was a nasty old mule on the other side looking all sad and nasty and disgusted. And she walked up to, and he put his nose to the fence, and she touched him. He said, Grandpa, that poor old mule has got to have grandma's religion. Look at him. You know. I say, the joy of the Lord is something you and I need to show forth, bring it out in our lives. Amen. Philippians chapter 3. I'm glad you're with us tonight, and if you have to live stream for one reason or another, we're glad you're listening. Let God minister to your life. I'm preaching a sermon I call Survival, Long-Term Christianity. How many of you want to be in it till the end? You know, if you know the story, the book, we'll win, hallelujah, all the way. And this is for keeps. And God is, I was going to say God plays for keeps. He's not playing. He's serious. He wants to keep you. And I was just talking to an old friend of mine, he's older than me, Brother Joe Campbell, who and we're going to have him here in uh, June for discipleship for our men. But Pastor Campbell, to many of you, he's, he's very familiar because we get him whenever we can. He's one of the leaders in our fellowship, a great preacher, uh, one of the finest. I just got to spend some time with him at the conference in the Midwest. He and I preached it at the same time, you know, morning and evenings where we switch around and I got to hear him, and I just called him yesterday, the day before, told him how much I appreciated him, and I was thinking of him a lot, but uh, I thought, and I told him on the phone, I said, Pastor Campbell, uh, I mean, he's had some major heart, uh, a heart attack, heart stopped overseas, he's had uh, several you know, surgeries, they broke his sternum, busted in, uh, went in, cut in, fixed things, repiped it, and he's still preaching, I told him, I said, you're preaching in March that I heard was as good a preaching as I've ever heard in my life. And I just told him how rich, how powerful, inspirational, and how much I appreciate it. And then I got to thinking about the term long-term Christianity. He, he's someone that comes to mind. He's another like Pastor Mitchell. He's going to finish his course. And every one of us ought to want to do that. And I want to preach to you out of uh, Philippians. This is the Apostle Paul writes these words in chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, it's not that I have already attained or am already perfect, perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold, uh, a hold, 
that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if it anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Now, this is a scripture that just really gets you know, blasted into my thinking, my heart, my whole process of thinking when I begin to think about long-term Christianity, because this is kind of the apostle writing there to encourage people that were very familiar with him, known him a while perhaps, and he is telling them, you know, listen, I haven't got there yet. How many of you feel like you're already done? You've done all God's called you to do. That's good. No takers. I'm not going to ask a second time. Amen. Don't do that. But uh, you, know, you haven't. We haven't arrived yet either, and neither are we perfected. Amen. And we need God's help. And the apostle himself says, listen, it's not like I've arrived, I've attained. He says, it's not like I'm perfected, but I'm pressing on. Amen. Amen. That should be something in all of us. As I preached this morning, you know, to do with building up your faith, your strength, you know, Holy Ghost power in you, wisdom, uh, dominion, good habits, good thinking, you know, holiness, all these things that help us. He says, listen, I am trying to lay hold of all that I can because I do believe and I know that God laid hold of me for a reason. And that's not just the preachers, the guys with the mic, the guy behind the pulpit. Every single saint of God has been captured by God, called by God to his purpose. And it may be preaching. It may be other ministries, but he has called you to himself, and the apostle says, we need to be mindful of this and ever pressing towards this upward call. Can you say amen? So if we're going to survive, make it all the way, and have long-term Christianity, several things need to be survived in life. And the first thing I want to talk about is surviving yourself. How many of you ever heard... The, the, the old phrase, you know, he's his own worst enemy. How many of us have ever felt like that? You didn't want to look in the mirror some mornings. Amen. There he is again. Amen. Yep, he's back. Like the uh, Arnold, you know, he's back. Amen. You thought you laid him to rest, you put him on the cross or her, but there you are in the morning. Amen. Have to work on that all over. But this brings to my mind, then why haven't some survived? Okay? You know, honestly, we, uh, we talk... You live for God for any amount of time, you will see people who will come, have great moments with God, perhaps great uh, encounter with God, and walk with God, sometimes for long periods of time, but then disappear or fall or backslide. And why does that happen? Well, number one, if we're going to survive, we got to survive ourselves. And when we come into the kingdom, how many of us had certain ways of thinking before we were saved? And after you're saved, you realize they still come around. Mindsets, ways of looking at life. So you've got to begin to understand not everything from the past can be held there. When I got saved, this is why the Bible teaches us so clearly. You have to renew your mind. Let God help you with that. You can't think the way you used to think. You know, I had... Plans, ideas. I had thoughts of where I wanted to go in life, what I wanted to do. And when I got saved, I really canceled that out, gave it up to God. I had a young man tell me uh, last year that he'd been so stern in his heart to surrender to God. Even though he was already surrendered, he had a lot of plans laid out that this is how my life will work and how God will do it. And he tells me, Pastor, tonight I erased the whole page and gave God a blank page. We should all do that. What do you want? This is what the wisdom of this great apostle was. When he had the, the revelation that this is Jesus Christ who's touched his life, who has saved him, died for him, embraced him, picking him up out of his sin. When the apostle Paul discovered it was Christ, 
His only words were, what do you want me to do? He didn't say, am I going to get to preach? Is that, I'll preach if you want, or I don't want to preach. All right, he just said, what? It's a blank page. What do you want? So we take mindsets with us when we get saved. And many times the mindset is the outlook on how we're going to navigate life. And I want to tell you, sometimes the way we've navigated in our past life has nothing to do with this present salvation and the way we need to think now. Some have the mentality, well, it's just the way it is. I've always been this way. I've counseled with Christians, sometimes been saved long times. Not a year, not two, not five, sometimes ten and more. And, and have this come out in the middle of counseling, trying to help them out of an issue, a problem, an arena of life they've fallen into. And here, well, it's just always been this way. You've got to change the mindset. It is not going to be that way if Christ rules in you. It's just what I've always done. The other thing we hear all the time is, well, my parents did this. I was speaking to a person one time well in their 80s, well in their 80s. I don't know the exact age, probably mid-80s. And I remember saying, you know, I prayed with this person, so I reached out to them and and I'm trying to help them. And I said, you know, it would probably just be good to get off the couch the next time I come to get you and I'll take you somewhere to do something, anything. They said, no, nah, I don't go out. My mom never went out. So? Well, we don't do that. We don't, I didn't mean I want to take this person out. I said, I want to bring them to church. I want to bring them around family, get them up to fellowship, get them in the church, do something. We'll come get you. We'll do anything. No, my mom did the same thing. That's what they tell me. I said, wow. And so now, 80-some years into life, you can't do something because it's always been that way. I want to tell you, after salvation, certain things in our minds and certain things that we thought are the way they are and going to be there forever, they've got to go. How long can you let things remain that should change? I don't know. It's a dangerous thing to play with. And sometimes, many times, it's for people, many years of success, etc. But in a moment of time, in a moment of crisis, in a midlife moment or something, if these things are looming, mindsets that were bad, poison in your vein, if it's still there, something's going to happen in life that'll trigger it. And that's what takes a lot of people out. You got to let God help you. If you leave it on the table, it could become a major temptation or issue tomorrow, old mindsets. You know, Paul wrote the apostle. He writes in the latter part in his life. He's, he's writing to Timothy. He says, you know, there's a I need some help because Demas has forsaken me. Remember that? He's, he names a guy. He says, this guy walked with us. He ministered with us. But he did depart. He loved this present world. What he's saying was there was something in his heart from still from the old life that surfaced. It got him at some critical point. Demas decided, I'm going back. You got to put some things out of your life. And at a critical time, he departed. We have... Uh, my wife, we're grandparents. She's a granny, a good one. But what she does is she puts all kinds, all the, all the kids are in children's church. Their kids are safe. I can announce this. Amen. They probably don't know. But my grandkids know where everything is. Everything that they should never eat. I don't eat candy, but we have candy in that house. Tons of candy. Candies, man. Made of pure sugar. We have snacks and cookies that have a, a you know, shelf life of 50 years, just filled with sugar and preserves. She's got stuff. She can bake goods and things. And it's always there. And after certain grandkids come by, sometimes be walking through the house. And here's a, you know, there's a candy wrapper. There's, a candy. there's outside in the yard. There's candy. I'll go back in and look. There's nothing in the bowls. It's empty. You know, if you didn't put them there and leave them there, they might never be tempted, hon. But, but out of sight, out of mind. You know, some of us leave stuff around here on the table of our minds. And when the wrong moment presents itself, it's easy. You know what? If the snacks weren't where 
these children could find them, they might not ever even think about it. And if this stuff doesn't, if, it, if we get it out of our lives, change our mindsets, old appetites, old desires, get some things gone from our hearts, our minds, get them off the table. Peter, in the time of crisis, the death, the resurrection of Christ, he resorts to his flesh. He's still dependent on what he can do. And then he goes back to the nets. Do you remember? Jesus called these men. And in Mark 1, in verse 17, he said to them, come after me. Come you after me. I'll make you become fishers of men. And verse 18 says, and immediately they forsook the nets and followed him. They didn't even hesitate. They'd heard enough. They'd seen enough. They said, I'm following Jesus. They forsook the nets. That word does not mean they, they left him there that afternoon. It means they said, we're done. We'll go with him. We'll become fishers of men. It went a little further, just a little further from there. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And straight away he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. These men, that it, it's not saying that, yeah, let's go have dinner and talk about this. He said, come, do what I do is what they mean. Come after me. If you, there's so much more to the terminology he uses here than the English language gives us. But G, these guys got up and said, we're done here. We're going with you. But you know, at crunch time, they all forsook him. These things weren't settled in their souls. And roots are not always visible. But if they're down, their stuff will crop up. Our old house, the house we had for 20 years on uh, Oak Rive. Thank you. I knew where it was. What we had over there, the property above where Ryan lived had mimosa trees. And they looked like a giant fern. And, uh, you know, I tried, uh, Brother Marty came over many times, helped me chop a bunch of that stuff. I said, it grows like a weed. But we'd let one big one grow, and, and uh, this young lady bought that house after my son had passed. And so uh, I'd go up there, I met her dad. He'd be up there working. I'd talk to him, witness to him, just share a little faith and try to help him. But we'd spend some time together up there. And one year I, I walked up, I said, wow, you cleared this off. He goes, they won't be back. I cut them all down. I said, let me give you a quick lesson. <laughs> I said, they'll all be back, and they'll bring friends. Amen. They'll, they'll bring friends. That's a mimosa tree. And he looked at me. He goes, that's a tree. I said, yeah, but those roots are underground. He said, but I cut it to the ground. Man, that place looks like a tropical forest. That stuff grows. You can't always see what's down there, but if you got it down in here and in here and you leave it, it'll try to find a way. Up. Often you hear in testimonies from people the things they forsook soon after conversion. They quit the job at the bar. I love to hear that. I stopped drinking. I love it. Sometimes I remember talking to a brother one time. This has happened before, but one time in particular comes to mind, and, and uh, I didn't know he'd got saved. Just seen him around once or twice, was trying to talk about salvation. And he said, oh, I got saved. I said, well, praise the Lord. You prayed. He goes, yeah, I quit smoking and drinking, cussing. Two weeks ago on Sunday. It's done. I don't do that no more. I said, wow, that's salvation. It's a change. And you know, if you're smart, you know, it's not just what you don't do. It's what do you begin to do now? And he's a wise man. What he does now is he's in church constantly. Every chance he gets, he's living the life. You hear people testify. They quit gambling. They stopped the drugs. The things that always took them down. I was saved just a matter of weeks. And I had a plan, a moose hunt plan, plan going on in um, Wyoming with uh, my little group of men I hunted and drank with. That's all we did. We drank and drank and drank and we were just rowdy, crazy people in the mountains. This was a part of them that I, that, that I worked with. And so I was one of the, in the crowd, and I had an all-expense-paid trip. Oh, man, it's a dream hunt for me, you know, young man. And the guy that was heading it up is one of the 
Man, he's one of the 10-star guides in the whole Western United States today. Just achieved everything he wanted to get out of it, you know. I mean, this is a dream hunt. And God spoke to my heart. You know, I'm, I don't know if my wife remembers this, but I just, I wasn't smart at all. I just got saved. I know I stopped drinking. I stopped. I, it was a battle, but I won. God helped me. I quit smoking and chewing. Those were battles, but God helped me. I stopped running around to the bars. I quit these things. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, my goodness, in September, I'm supposed to go north for two plus weeks with this group of men. They're all married, working men, businessmen, but they do drink and they like to drink. And they expect you to drink. And I told my wife, I can't go. I think she threw a party. Amen. I don't know if you remember. I can't remember. Just For me, it was like, oh, my gosh, I can't do it. It's killing me. Probably, the, probably a decision that saved my salvation. Seriously. You have to start thinking different. You can't leave a crack in the door in your armor that it becomes a future temptation. got to think of some defenses. I preached a little bit about that this morning, building up some spiritual muscle, thankfulness, gratitude, appreciation. Always remember the Lord your God. Amen. Who saved you. Always remember the brethren. That means your wife or your husband, even your kids. They're in that category. Remember them. Be thankful. Philemon, Paul writes in chapter 4, verse he says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. How many people do you pray for on a regular basis that you thank God for them? This is why we open the building for prayer. You'll think of people to pray for. Look around you. We need a lot of prayer here. I covet your prayers, man. I want them. And pray for Pastor Spicer and Pastor King. And our wives, they have to live with us. And our families, pray for one another. And Paul writes to Philemon and says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have towards the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints. See, he says this is a mutual part of our relationship. We love one another. And the sharing of your faith, that it may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. You know what? You want to make it long term in your Christianity? You want to one day wake up in heaven? You want to go the long haul? Be thankful. Change the old mindsets. Check those things in your heart. But love people the way God loves people. Love your wife the way you love God. Love your husband that way. Never forget what you were and where you came from. Can we say thank God? And be humble. Paul writes, he says, you know, I know what I have. Even in our text, as he begins the text we had, he says, I, it's not like I'm perfect or ready. I'm just trying my best to lay hold of everything God has put before me that I can please him, finish this course. And I don't think I've apprehended. I'm not there, but I'm working on it. Have faith in God. Raise your expectations. Some people look too low in Life, You know, I had literally seen this in a movie when I was very young, confused man in my eight teens. And just seen this corny movie and some guy lived his life with the lowest of expectations. And someone asked him one time why. He said, that way I'm never disappointed. You know what I said? I seen it in the movie because I also experienced it in life. Person that had gotten saved, absolutely saved. But they put the bar so low in life. And when I tried and tried and tried to help them, they finally told me basically the same thing. I don't expect much. I don't do much. Some people are simply focused on the lower half of life. I got a story from a therapist. 
He counseled a couple of people. And the article goes, she started her day worrying about what could go wrong. That's how she began. I preached this morning. I'm saying to you, start your day talking to God. No, this poor woman started her day worrying about what could go wrong. She anticipated encountering some unexpected problems or a curveball to be thrown at her. But at the end of the day, she was able to breathe a sigh of relief because she got through another day without a wicked mishap or unforeseen problem. She expected the worst, and at the end of the day, it was like, whew, I made it. That's putting the bar way down. Can I tell you, you can expect great things in a great God. Hallelujah. She felt safe, but with no joy or experience of happiness throughout her day. There was another guy. He was always nervous that a problem would arise he wouldn't be able to handle. This made him anxious. So he lived his life. He anticipated, what next? What's going to, I got to deal with it. I'm a businessman. What and again, his success in getting through the day without any major going wrong uh, it reinforced his negative mindset. What they had in common was this, their focus on the lower half of life's possibilities. I'm not a possibility preacher. And I don't preach that, you know. You confess it and possess it, you know. Grab it, you know, blab it and grab it. God will, you know, you know mind over matter. I, I don't preach that. I don't preach just have a positive attitude. Everything will be. I preach no God. Walk with him. Here's people winding up at a low point or even a midpoint every day through life was okay with them. That's where their mind would take them and that's where they live. Another thing you can't do if you're going to get over yourself is don't take yourself so seriously. I have so appreciated the long-term relationships I have. I think Pastor Spicer mentioned tonight has been saved 22 years. He's probably almost right. Something like that. Pastor King was here before I got here. Him and Lee, we have, we're working on lifelong friendships, relationships. And I so appreciate that, you know, sometimes when we sit down to have a morning meeting, it sounds more like we're roasting one another. Have a little fun. We can laugh at ourselves. You know, don't take yourself so serious. No one else does. <laughs> That's a proverb. It's in my book. <laughs> Bible tells you don't think of yourself more highly than you are. That's foolishness. We feel quite often in life. You know, that we're, we, we've made it. We haven't made it. Listen, if you're going to make it, you haven't got there yet. This is why the apostle writes, listen, for, he starts out, I have not gotten there. How many of you know Paul was probably doing a lot better than most of us spiritually? <laughs> he says, no, nope, I'm not there. That's some work to do. And let me tell you, I'm, some of the unhappiest people on God's earth are perfectionists because they've never found it. In their own world either. But most folks typically treat themselves a little bit more on the negative side. That's, that's just the way it is. And, you know, how about for yourself, having some expectations in God, his will for your life? How about having the, I, <laughs> I preached a sermon. I think I preached this in my mother church in Payson, Arizona, probably 40-some years ago. One of my beginner sermons uh, usually they had about, about 25, 30 pages handwritten, every line. You know, I, I, you know how to, God called me. I'm trying. I'm working at it. But I preached a sermon. And I had someone tell me that they, were, they had never thought of God being able to smile at their life. I said, thank God you heard what I was preaching. How many of you know God might even smile when he looks at you sometimes? He might laugh. But he can smile. He loves you. And it's, it's amazing how many days some Christians can live in the lower half of life, in the doldrums of faith, and never, ever consider the fact that God might be wanting to help you smile on you. So you got to survive yourself. you got to survive other people, too. 
How many of you, you mean people can give you problems? I thought you said this morning, listen, people can give you problems. It doesn't mean you have to respond to it. That's what I mean. They can't make you do anything. Joseph in the Old Testament, he's a type of Christ. He's a savior of two nations. You know, Egypt and Israel. He was placed somewhere very important by the hand of God. But, you know, he had to survive all the demonic activity that came against him by way of family, by people, even family, inflicted stuff upon him. And I think this is Pastor's, Pastor Campbell's quote. The pain of people prepares you for the service and ministry of God in your life. Sometimes it does. Joseph, no doubt, would have never have gone to Egypt on his own. Did you ever think about that when you read the story? Joseph, you know, he's in, well, remember when, when his brothers are, you know, un, the truth is unfolding and they realize we're standing before Joseph. We've all but killed him. We've ruined his life. We've ruined our father's life. We've lived a lie all these years. And Joseph is revealed to them, and they're freaking out. He says, no, no, no. God put me here. Wait a minute. You read the story. You know full well those boys betrayed him and sold him off as a slave, their own brother. But you see, he, he didn't let that say, well, this is uh, my life's ruined. It put him in this place where the will of God came about and there's no doubt he would never have ended up in Egypt but this ends up he ends up there prepared and equipped for what for destiny you got to survive family sometimes you know you have calling and wife and husband are not on the same page dads and moms pull on you I remember we answered the call to preach our families are uh, <laughs> you know our families were, were pretty fragmented you know at best I could say that you know the they were families of sorts, you know. There was a lot of people hated one another. A lot of people, I, I'm not quite sure exactly how many times our parents had been married. Various people and not married. And they, well, they, they, you know, they did their thing, lived their life. I don't know what happened there. It was a mess. But we get saved, my wife and I. There was a, uh, basically a, uh, what do you call it, like a, an agreement amongst many of the, of the elders of our family. They just hated me. <laughs> co-equally <laughs> as messed up as the whole family is i was i mean i didn't like they didn't like me because i was the one that would go in and out of jail and do drugs and stuff and they were all better than that and they're a mess of their drinking and everything else and their hatred and stuff but i was a mess and so but when we get saved all of a sudden i became the the one that brought them all together with an equal amount of hate <laughs> Sim that's kind of how it went just something like that and we would witness to them and preach to them, and they would mock us and mock us and mock us. And now they realize I'm a nice guy. They never knew that. Now we're getting along. We're trying. We're reaching out to them. My wife's a wonderful woman. She reaches out. We have some family relations. But, you know, as soon as we go to answer the call of God, everyone collectively uh, all around in that family said we're crazy. What are you doing that for? Ruining your life. We had people visit us years after we were in the ministry and say, you, you've moved again? You're in another church, another city. You're doing this. You're do what are you guys going to do? We're going to do this all our lives. Serve God. Whatever he calls. Sometimes you got to survive your family. Amen. You have to survive Potiphar. Joseph had to survive him. Here's a guy that received Joseph into his house, appreciated him, blessed him. You know what? Joseph might have never left Potiphar's house if his wife hadn't put the booze on him. Isn't that interesting? And that's why he ends up in jail. Isn't it? His story is so incredible. He might have never made it to Egypt. Who would have saved the nation? He might have never made it out of Potiphar's house. He had it made there. He was raised up in power and blessing, authority. He might have retired there. You've got to get past people, whether they think they're helping you or they hurt you. or they, You've got to survive people. You have to know who is, you should have in your life. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. 
One translation says, evil communication. This stuff you hear and speak for, with people, they speak to you. Evil associations, it corrupts. It destroys your victory. You want to survive and be a Christian as long as it takes to get to heaven? You got to understand not everyone is your friend. You can love folks and witness to them. I have sinner friends that are very good sinners. They're experts. And they know I love them and they know they can talk to me and they know I will talk to them. And I, they know we can actually eat a meal together or we can go fishing or do this together. But they know I don't do what they do. And I don't judge them and put my nose up in the air, down, look down and whatever. You know, but I, but I stand for Christ. You can't let them influence you. And the facts of the matter is there are some people that just aren't good for you and I to be around. Joseph had to survive women, lust. You got to protect yourself. I tell our staff, I tell all men going in ministry, you got no business sitting alone somewhere behind closed doors, counseling women, doing anything like that. We don't do that. We protect ourselves. All failures of that type, they begin with words. You, Joseph had to survive Potiphar's wife. You know, Elijah had to survive Jezebel. You know, you got to survive. You got to survive people you help. In jail, Joseph helped the butler and the baker, if you remember the story. He helped them. Even Potiphar, he didn't violate the man. He did really good. But these people didn't return the goodness. You got to survive it. You got to know Jesus. And if you do this, sometimes you got to survive people who might even hurt you. You know, you got to survive people. Then you've got to maintain spiritual passion. That's kind of what I talked about this morning. You can put that under the umbrella of this third point I'm making. And as we age and we go through all of the above, the things I talked about, it might even be a greater challenge. A temptation can develop when you haven't handled those other things properly. Temptation like David. You remember David was king not all that long when he decided he was tired of fighting wars. That was his job. But rather than be where he's supposed to be, if you know the story, he stayed back and he fell into immorality and adultery and murder. Horrible situation. He stayed home rather than go where he needs to go. You know, brother, sister, when it's time for you to speak to someone, to witness, when it's time to you for you to be on your knees or seeking God in prayer, when it's time for you to be reading your Bible, don't find something else to do. Don't go weary in well-doing. When it's time to go on an outreach, get on an outreach. Reach someone else. Nothing's better for your faith than telling someone else what you know and believe. Helping them. You know, Moses, 40 years old, when he gets banished to the wilderness by himself the first time, He's, he's just out in Bibidian. He's in the wilderness alone, tending sheep. He's so educated. He is a brilliant man. He's been schooled in the finest of Egypt's homeschool system. He's been raised in the palace. And now he's a 40-year-old man, and he spends 40 more years tending sheep in the wilderness. You think after 40 years, his Fire and passion for God might have went out, but it didn't. God was able to revive him. You know, if you don't have this burning inside of you, you know, time can steal it. People can steal it. Things, your, your old ways of thinking can steal it. Some of you remember part of Michael Jordan's story. You know, he was only 30 years old when his father was killed. Remember that? He was at the top of his basketball career in 1993. Was it three champions they already had? Some of you guys know for sure, and you'll correct me afterwards, I'm sure. But I think he got three championships. You know, he had, uh, oh, he had the um, gold medal, the United States team, dream team. Height of his success with years to go, but his father is taken out of his life, and he made some statement. I can remember. I read it, too. Read it again not long ago, but, you know, he literally said, I, I've already proved it. I'm done. It's 30. But he came back. 
because this was burning in his soul. He loved the game. He's the guy that loved the game. He had a passion for basketball. He comes back after he walks away, and he wins again. Sometimes in life, there's going to be certain things that can just fall into your lap, and if you don't have passion, you can just walk out. Walk out. My wife and I, our oldest son died, and we didn't think he was going to die that young in life. Let me tell you, even when he got ill, and some of you were around, some of you helped us greatly during those times, and, you know, just, you just, no, he's not, but he did, he died. He wanted to be with the Lord. We have full confidence. But I'm going to tell you, it just knocks you, takes your breath away, even though you can't get as prepared as you can. But you know what? Immediately, God put in my heart, I still need to serve him. And you, the church, is calling destiny in our life. My wife needed me more than ever to stay focused and love her and be there. My sons needed me. I needed them. You had to stand up and go forward. I remember Pastor Campbell. I've heard his story over and over about his daughter dying, falling off a cliff. She said, just, I think she's just almost 20. She's just a teenager. He's in Malaysia. She dies at a Bible conference a week away. He's his head spinning what to do. What to do is he had to serve God. He determined, I am called. I have a purpose in God. He did what God called him. The Apostle Paul, Acts 14, 19, says the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there where he was. They had persuaded the multitudes. They seated people against him, and they stoned Paul. Listen, when they stone you back then, they don't throw rocks. You know, know, they get the biggest one. They like to start a good stoning by pushing you off a cliff so you break some bones. You can't go nowhere. Then, honest, that's you. We can read history. They had places, locations. They do this. That's why they tried to chase Jesus to a certain place. When, they, when he first opened his mouth and preached, they had a place to do that. Chase him there and throw him out. He disappears. He makes it to his destiny. But they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. That's a good stoning. He's, they, they figured he's dead. Look at him. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up. And he went to the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Well, what would he do there? Well, he preached some more. He recovered. When he had preached the gospel to that city, he made his recovery. He made many disciples. After a while, you know what he did? He returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Why did he return? He returned and preached. He strengthened the souls of the disciples, exhorted them to continue in the faith and said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church, they prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Here's Paul. After he takes uh, the most severe of beatings, what does he do? He goes right back where he was as soon as he's healthy and he encourages the others. Listen, you want to be in this for the long haul, learn to bring encouragement. Learn to do the will of God. I was questioned by a couple of the Kazakh brethren, and I'm going back over there in another month. Pastor Dominguez is, and Josie are there doing the work for God. And I had this happen on the trip one year, two years ago, and last May I was questioned the same question by guys there they would ask me, is this just a season where you can, you know, we can get an American in, you guys can come and preach. They're begging us to preach to these men. They want to know, and they tell me, eyeball to eyeball through the interpreter, we got to learn how to make disciples. We got to learn how to reach our world. We have to learn how to plant churches. And some issues came up, and we decided this last year to work through some things. Maybe we're not going to invest in that. We're going to just try to make converts. And these men pleaded with us, help us. We want to learn this. And what they asked me, do you think this is just a season like an open door? Is it right? I said, what do you think I'm doing here? 
Seriously, I do know that. And they said, so you mean like God can open doors and close? Yes. We had China wide open a while ago. Then it shut. We had Russia kind of open, and it shut. No Americans could go in. We have still an opportunity in, in, in uh, Kazakhstan. And I believe it's an open door. And I believe in all kinds of seasons that God can open and close. But you know what we need is we need people who can stay the course. When God opens doors, we're ready to do what God's called us to do and to be what God's called us to be. We haven't finished our course. There's men and women here called to preach. They have to rise up. I'm serious. Got to rise up. Stop thinking the way you used to think. Stop thinking it's someone else's job. You can't do it. Start answering God. Start preparing your heart and your life with all you can. Change the way you used to think. Get your passion going. Maintain your soul. Take care of your soul. And let God bring his destiny to your life. Like Paul, you, you have not attained. You haven't got there. And God apprehended you. Yes, number one, to redeem you from your sin, but number two, for his purpose. Who knows what he wants to do with your life? Let's bow our heads tonight. Let's do that. Close our eyes, bow our heads, and pray. Who knows what God wants to do with your life? So, well, I think he wants to use me for some ministry. Then let him. Find out what it is. Find out what you need to do. Well, I, I'll wait, and I'll find out. Well, you won't find out if you don't seek him. That's why we have an altar Altars, not just for some folks that feel they need to go. You know, pastor feels good if they go to the altar. No, it's where we seek God and we meet him. And I don't know, one of the brothers opening in prayer, was it tonight or this morning, said, let us have, a, draw us to the altar. I said, hallelujah. Yes, that's my prayer. Draw me to the altar with you, God. Draw us to an altar where we can put our life down a living sacrifice and meet with you. You know, there has been a great sacrifice for our lives, and it was Jesus himself. His blood was shed, poured out on the altar of Calvary for our salvation. He died in our place. Just the most incredible of stories, this perfect, sinless Son of God, the only begotten Son who came to this earth, became a man, and then gave his pure life to pay the price for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of the world. That's the covering. And the Bible teaches us very explicitly, you must come under that blood, must by faith receive that great gift of forgiveness and salvation he offers. And tonight I'm asking you, Maybe as our heads are bowed, you'd say, you know what, I, I, I'm not right with God. I'm just not right. I, I want to be. I want to know Christ. I want to honor God. I want to be forgiven. I want his love in my life. I, I want to change. I want you then to lift a hand towards heaven and say, yes, I want to know what it is to be a Christian. I need Christ. I've not been living like a Christian. I want God to touch my life tonight. Hold a hand up towards heaven if that's your prayer. Hold it up where I can see, and, and we'll pray. I'll pray for you. God will, God will touch your life. But you lift that hand right where you're seated and say, I need to get myself right with God tonight. I want Jesus in my heart and life. I'm not right. I want it. I want to be changed. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm just asking you, would you let God do that for you? By lifting that hand towards heaven, you'd say, Lord, here I am. Signify, yes, I want this to change. I want to know my purpose in you. Why did you come for me? What can you do in my life? He can save you and absolutely forgive you and change every dynamic of life for you. You lift that hand and say, I want to know that. I want to feel that. I want to experience Christ. I want to know forgiveness. Holding your hand up, you'd say, this is my need. I need Jesus Christ. I need him. Christian, how much of the old do we hang on to that keeps us living the lower half 
of our destiny, of life, of our purpose. Keeps us struggling down there. Can't get our expectations up. Can't put our hopes up. They get dashed. They get smashed. We get comfortable living with defeat. That This is a common issue amongst Christianity. It, it, I have to fight. Everyone does. But there is a God who's a victor. And he wants to rule and reign in your heart. Set him on the throne of your heart and pursue him wholeheartedly. Let's stand to our feet tonight while the musicians are playing and the singers are singing a song of worship. Let me invite you to the altar. Come, you lay hold of God. Spend some time before him. Make some changes in your heart, in your life. Pursue him. Open your heart. Ask him. Maybe like Paul did on that wonderful day of his conversion. What would you have me to do? What is it I should be doing? What is it that I've settled for? And what is it you want, God? Let him help you tonight. Let him minister deep within your soul. praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wonderful God of heaven. Lord of lords. We worship you, God. Glorify your son in us, God. Be magnified. Be praised. Amen. You know, it will really lift your life to be a witnesser, a soul winner, telling people what Christ does and who he is and who he, what he's done in your life. Just tell folks that's a good starting point. 
make changes, make sure you contemplate life, you know, the way you think, why you still think certain ways. Why does it continue if it's holding you back? Do you have call, purpose, your destiny? Why is it you haven't got there? I can find someone to blame. No, 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 you can't. Uh, if anyone had issues, it was Joseph. He could have easily said, man, they ruined my life. But every step put him in a greater place. God was able to. You see, when the heart is where it needs to be with God, God gets business done. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's a lot of good stuff happening. Please stay on board helping. I heard from Pastor Francis. He was shouting the victory over outreach that yesterday. You guys were down there helping in Charleston. Amen. We got more outreaches coming up. There's so many good things happening. Be involved. Be a part of it all. Be in prayer. We opened this building. And as uh, Pastor Spicer said, the building's open for anybody to pray all, all morning. Every one of us. You know, I, I remember thinking at some point, I don't know how long it was I was saved before I realized I never joined a church. I was born into it. Just like you. Born into the family of God. Yep, we filled out a card somewhere. But I mean, you know what? I was a part of God's church. I wanted to pray with God's church. We ask you to help us pray. We open this building. That big old foyer is open every morning. It's air conditioned. It's wonderful. You can come and have a seat. You can sit on the ground, sit in a chair. You can, but you can pray and touch the throne of heaven. Amen. So we encourage you to help us with that. You might see God alongside of us. And like Paul, he said, man, I thank God for you and all of you over and over daily. And, and yes, many of us do. That's the way we pray, man. You'll think of people to pray for. You'll think of things to pray about. You know, make your world bigger than just yours. Amen. And you'll be blessed. So blessed. Praise the Lord. Uh, God bless you tonight. It was a baby shower tomorrow night, right? First, next one. Pastor Spice, right? Right? Got it right. And that is for glory. Okay. All right, right here. Yep, David Glory, right there. Okay, there you are. Okay, I've looked, I was looking over there because I always see you guys over there. I said, I don't know what happened. I'm uh, confused. Did the ushers tell you you can sit there? I don't know. That's, good. That's a joke. We do that all the time when someone's not where I'm used to seeing them. Praise the Lord. Yes, for our sister, their new addition tomorrow night. God bless you tonight. Anthony, uh, one Anthony, why don't you close us with a word of prayer? Amen. And men, don't forget, Pastor Don Kuchkowski is going to be here on Friday.